Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer On webinar, the cold hard truth about BDCs and why you need a BDD. My name is Eliana Raggio, and I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is being presented by Dealer On. And for anyone who isn't familiar with Dealer On, well, we are an award-winning website development company and digital agency, and we're best known for our amazing SEO, the absolute best customer service, and the highest converting website designs in the industry, including the brand new Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. And I'm thrilled to announce that Dealer On has been named again as a top-rated website provider in the recent sixth annual Driving Sales Dealer Satisfaction Awards, and and we also won the Pinnacle Award from AWA, the highest honor a website company can get. So we want to thank you so much for all your votes, and of course, we're very, very pleased about that. And for more information on who we are and what we do, please check us out at our gorgeous brand new Dealer On website at DealerOn.com. And we have a great show in store for you today. We're very pleased to have the one and only David Kane as our presenter today. David Kane is president of KaneAutomotive.com, an award-winning training consulting company that specializes in automotive internet sales, BDCs, digital marketing, and social media, with a focus on improving dealership sales and profits. Notably, Kane Automotive was voted Best Internet Sales Training Company for the last five years in a row in the Dealer's Choice Awards by Auto Dealer Monthly Magazine. David Kane has 20 plus years of extensive automotive retail experience, and he also co-founded FordDirect.com, a dealer factory-owned joint venture that provides the internet leads at to Lincoln and Ford dealers. David is an active speaker at many industry events, including the NADA conventions, state association workshops, digital dealer conferences, and manufacturer training conferences, as well as numerous 20 groups. Phew! And he can be reached at david at caneautomotive.com. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. And please let me know exactly who you are and please frame it in the form of a question too at the end of the presentation we're going to answer those questions of general interest if we're unable to get to your question live don't worry we're going to try and respond to you by email later today also don't forget a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will also be emailed to you later today for your reference and please feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues oh and guess what our good friends at Kane Automotive are giving away a great prize today on the webinar one of you lucky webinar attendees is going to be winning one month of free access to Kane Automotive's online university. This is an amazing prize for your dealership. This prize is valued at $895 and it includes their exclusive eight steps to internet success module. Now, to win this, you got to be on the live broadcast, so stay tuned. You could be the one walking away with this amazing prize today. Also, I want to let you know, Kane Automotive is going to be having some upcoming amazing Kane Automotive micro workshops. That's right. You see them on the screen now. They're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different uh, projects, and the full schedule is available at KaneAutomotive.com and also to find out more. But these are upcoming, and if you haven't signed up for one of these or ever attended one, I'm going to let you know they are a fantastic workshop, well worth your time. Please go check them out at KaneAutomotive.com. Also, at the conclusion of the webinar, you're going to receive a short survey, so fill it out because we're always looking for great feedback from our audience. Today we're going to randomly select a couple of people from all the completed surveys to win some Google prizes. So let's get started. Let's learn the cold hard truth about BDCs and why you need a BDD. David Kane, I always love hearing your southern drawl on one of my webinars. How are you, my friend? I'm doing very well. Thank you, Eliana. <laughs> and I, uh, I think we've got the routine down. I was able to click forward on the slides at the right cadence, so I'm <laughs> glad we're getting the hang of it. Yeah, yeah. actually, this is the fifth time you have been, done more webinars with me than anyone else, and I'm always so pleased and honored when you're here. So thank you so much for being here today, and boy, oh boy, you really knocked it out of the park with this topic. We have a ton of people who registered for this webinar. Lots of people want to know about this whole BDD thing. Now, of course, as everyone knows, a BDC is a business development center, and many dealerships have them. Some dealerships don't. 
Um, but what you're trying to tell people is you can go beyond that. And instead of just having a little portion of your dealership being a business development center, you're saying a BDD is make it a business development dealership. So we're very excited to learn about this. This definitely flies in the face of convention. And we're excited. David, tell everyone the kinds of things we're going to be learning about today. Excellent. So first off, we're going to talk about um, the, the limitations that are, that are really starting to show up in BDC environments. And uh, we'll get into a lot of detail on that. Uh, we'll emphasize expectations for salespeople and managers, given the BDC strength um, and, and what we're seeing happening on the sales floor. Then we'll focus on creating the culture of success at the dealership and uh, how dealerships need to start rewarding high achievers for business generation that they do on their own. And then we'll encourage socially successful sales team members and talk about uh, any questions that they have for me and uh, we'll provide any answers that we can think of. So that's what we'll do. That sounds like so an excellent What I'd like to do is let's talk about creating your business development dealership. And a lot of people think that that's probably a threat to a business development center. So I want to uh, help you set aside those concerns right away because we have actually set up a lot of business development centers that are fabulously successful. And uh, I often like to say that I've been to more BDC funerals than I have births, and that's <laughs> True. Unfortunately, we see a lot of dealerships that when they do design their BDC, they don't do it properly. And uh, we get a lot of pressure from on high. Perhaps our manufacturer is, is pushing it. We come back from a 20 group meeting and we say we've got to have this. But unfortunately, uh, just simple design of a business development center doesn't always take into um, concern all the complexities that go on in a typical dealership environment. So what we find today, and, and I've worked with a lot of dealerships, and, and as Ileana pointed out, our family's been in the business since 1952, and I was raised with my eight brothers and sisters in the store, and my father's still at 85 years old coming in every day to uh, watch over the family business. So. My brothers and sisters do a great job operating the store, but it's awful nice to have somebody with that kind of experience. But even at, even at our dealership, um, what we see is salespeople waiting and waiting, uh, still looking out the window, waiting for the telephone to ring. And I guess what happened in that kind of environment is our skills started to wane, and when the opportunity to get digital came about, we had a large percentage of salespeople say, well, I'm going to really specialize in the floor. And, uh, and that's a really dangerous proposition in today's environment because when we get to that level to where we have that segmentation, uh, we start to see skills deteriorate. So the solution, driven by a lot of dealerships and one that I've supported greatly, is to develop business development centers. And they do a really magical job of uh, helping customers as they go through the shopping process. Uh, if you create the right appointment culture and get people to visit your store, you'll be able to do a wonderful job. And additionally, as we see the environment going to digital retailing, where a lot of dealerships are, are working to literally sell the vehicle uh, in the online environment, and, and call it what you will today, 5%, 2%, uh, it is a growing segment of the population of buyers out there, and we need to be fully aware of it. Um, I hate to age myself this much, but a lot of you all on the phone would agree with me, right, Ralph Ebersol? Uh, that the, the fact is, when the Internet first started up in the mid-90s, a lot of us were sitting here going, well, it's only 1% of the business, it's only 2% of the business. Well, nowadays it's like 99% of the business. And ultimately, what we're finding is when customers want to go online and do digital retailing, we've got to make sure that our team is ready for that. So business development centers, really, my question would be, is this really the solution? Because when we get to the floor, um, we still have some concerns. 
What I'd like to do at this point is, uh, Eliana, if you could set up our first poll question, that would be great. That sounds like a perfect entrance into that. Okay, audience, you have four poll questions coming your way today. This is your first. It's a pretty easy one. We hope you'll enjoy it, and we hope you'll participate. The question is on your screen now. Does your dealership currently have a BDC, a Business Development Center? Please select one of the following options. Yes, and it's very successful. Yes, but we're looking for improvements. Yes, but we admit we aren't getting the results we would like. No, but we're planning one. Or no, and we're comfortable not having one. Once we get a majority of those votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. And uh, audience, thank you so much. And by the way, David, I want to let you know, Ralph Eversall, he wrote in, right, so he absolutely agreed with you. <laughs> Oh, and then Heather also wrote in. We don't have her answer. She says, what about no, but we used to. Now, that's interesting, Heather. So you closed your BDC. Wondering, did you transfer over to a BDD? Interesting. And audience, thank you so much. You guys rock. Almost everyone has voted now. So we'll give it another couple seconds, and then we will close this poll and share the results. And also, David, we had Jay who wrote in, and he says, let me just pull this up. He says he's working on a hybrid system with his entire sales floor. So I'm looking to see if that's kind of what you're going to be talking about when you talk about a BDD. Um, Katie says, how about yes, but we're just getting off the ground. Ah, I like that. Dean says he's got a hybrid thing going on too. And Adam says, yes, our director has been doing this for six years, but it's brand new to us, and we're doing the hybrid as well. So next time we know, we need to put a hybrid answer in there, David. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's close this poll and share the results. Audience, you guys are great. Thank you so much for voting. All right, David? An audience, thirteen percent of today's audience said yes, they do currently have a BDC, and it is very successful. The majority, however, fifty-three percent, more than half, said yes, but we are looking for improvements. Now, seven percent of today's audience said yes, but we aren't quite getting the results we would like. Twelve percent said no, but we're planning on having one, and the remaining fifteen percent said no. And you know what? We're okay with not having one. David, is that the kind of results you were thinking you were going to get? 53% said that they have them but looking for improvement? Yeah, I don't see any surprise there, and I'm uh, often glad to hear that. I was uh, on a panel at NADA recently, and, and several of the panelists uh, were under the impression that dealerships couldn't do without uh, all the vendors in the marketplace. and. And I, I think the, the fact of the matter is there are great vendors and there are those who, who think that there's really need them to thrive. And, and I, for one, being raised in a dealership, understand that dealers will eventually figure it out. So it's great to have an opportunity like to share ideas, but what I've learned about dealerships is they, they ultimately will figure it out and uh, adapt to the right situation for what their needs are. So what, what I really want to say, though, is with BDCs, they um, were created to be the solution, but what we're really seeing is the sales team is still waiting. And a lot of this came to me as I was uh, working with one of my clients who said, gosh, you know, we're just not doing a very good job with commercial trucks. We're not getting out and meeting the customers that are, are looking uh, to do this. Our sales people aren't real active in generating their own business. Can you help me with this? And um, Fortunately, they have a very successful BDC. So when I started doing a little research and looking at the situation that was going on in so many of the dealerships that have successful BDCs, is we were seeing skills deterioration from the sales floor. And I remember when I was a salesperson, I had a IBM Selectric typewriter that was state-of-the-art back uh, in the early 80s. And each night I would, would go home, my wife Eve and I, I uh, would eat dinner and then uh, put the kids to bed and I would go to the dining room and I would queue up my letters and I would type them out. And uh, man, this thing was so awesome. I could spin that letter in there, uh, type the hello first name, and then I'd hit F, F4 or F7 or whatever the letter I'd saved and that thing two or three minutes later would crank out a letter. I'd fold it up, put the stamp on it, 
and send it out. And surprisingly, even back then, that did a really wonderful job. We didn't have the internet, and uh, the customers really appreciated the fact that we showed some concern. But what we're finding with business development centers is we're almost creating a, an atmosphere on the floor to where salespeople are now complaining uh, with the quality of the appointments, the quality of the opportunities, and saying, well, you know, I appreciate the fact that you had someone come in, but unfortunately, the credit wasn't so good. They wanted to look at five cars. The car you told me to get ready wasn't the one they really wanted. Uh, next time, ask them this, that, and the other thing. And I think what we're finding is this privileged attitude is born from the fact that we're not really crafting a business development uh, attitude throughout the whole dealership. So the real solution is a culture change. And what we asked our clients to do in 2015 is to create a business dealership. And when we look at a business development dealership, it's the blending of the floor and the BDC to where they work together and the dealership benefits from all the marketing activities of both of those uh, environments. The result being that we will be able to get back on the up bus route. And the nice thing about being on the up bus route is we get to go out, look in the showroom, and it's almost like Walmart on Black Friday. We can predict a really, really good future when we are doing a great job of business generation. And I, I see this all the time when I'm in a dealership on a Friday and they post all the appointments that were set by the BDC. Very seldom are there appointments set by the floor team. And I remember back when I was selling cars, that was what our rally cry was, well, let's, let's get some appointments. But we didn't have a BDC. We had to go generate it on our own. So the culture change the sales manager of the dealership. And one of my favorite phrases is, if it is to be, it is up to me. And I, I really want to uh, pat the progressive sales managers on the back and encourage them to really stay focused on that so that they're in a position where they understand that the obligation to make the culture change is really up to them. And ultimately, we think that sales managers must own sales. And oftentimes what we see is a separation of the floor manager from the BDC or the internet operation, and we just see that being a real uh, challenge to progress at the dealership. So I just want to break this down in, in real simple terms. To change culture, we really must change habits. And that's more difficult than we might give credit to. So when we talk about the activity habit, that's something that we're really beating the drum on a lot. And I do know this, that when I was a salesperson, I had this silly saying that um, in order for me to have busyness, I've got to do busy work. And the more busy work I do, the more busyness I get. And it is so accurate. And when I'm having a great day of selling, I tend to forget how to go do my business development. And one of the curses we see at the dealership is, a salesperson has a big day, so we alleviate the responsibility for them to do their business development activities. And we've got to stop that. So the activity habit can quickly be known as the success habit. And when we create a success habit, we really build a great future for ourselves as individual salespeople and for the dealership. So breaking it down just a bit more, activity really is the condition in which things are being done. And we have a lot of people out there doing stuff, but we've got to put them in a position where their activities really bear the fruit and the benefit for the dealership and for themselves. And, and looking at the word habit, a regular practice that's hard to give up. And we've all got them. And I read this great book called The Power of Habit, and it talks about why we do what we do in life and business. And, and it really provoked me to think Man, you know, all these habits that we've had since childhood, how to put on our shoes, uh, how to uh, dress ourselves, um, how to put on our watch, um, how to walk around the block, things that will never go away. And, and that's the beauty of a great habit is 
We just never will lose it. And the only way, according to the scientific research in this book, that we can create a new habit is to work it over the top of the old one. And the old one, sadly, will never go away. So we've got to bear in mind that the only way we're going to create something that's lasting is to work on it. So we've got to create new habits in the dealership with sales teams. And for all of you all who said that you were already working on your hybrid models, I want to pat you on the back because uh, I think that's really the key to where we're going with the BDD. So we can go big. And when we talk about creating habits, what I like to focus on is get a team dialed in for a 50 a day habit. And if you think about it, do we know 25 people we could send the emails to today? Can we make 15 telephone calls if we're a floor salesperson? And maybe we can go in and like uh, our friend's post on Facebook. Maybe we can endorse someone on LinkedIn. Maybe we can uh, give a thumbs up or, or favorite something on Twitter. Uh, I know right now that our friend Kevin Fry has tweeted about 50 times since this webinar has started. So he's blowing up <laughs> us right now. And, and when you think about that, that's how you establish clout with your customers. And even if we wanted to start small and just say we wanted to do a 20 a day habit, 10 emails, surely we know 10 people we can send an email to, five people we can make a phone call to, or five social contacts. Or maybe we start even smaller and just do 10 a day, five emails, three phone calls, two social contacts. It's surprisingly really easy when we're able to do that. Um, the other thing we need to do is recognize that as soon as we start asking our team to do this, they're going to say to us, you've got to be kidding. And, and I've managed a sales team for a long time. And, and if I was giving a $2,000 bonus at the end of the month, the, the performers that were really uh, incredulous would come up to me afterwards and figure out that we have essentially, uh, can you give me just a moment, please? Oh, did we lose you for a minute? Okay, while he's... Eliana, I'm right back. Oh, okay. I had a, uh, a FedEx driver that was dropping off something knocking at the door here. So, oh, my. So really what we've got to do is to make sure that we understand what the environment is, and we've got to survive in such a way to where uh, the salespeople really know that this is all for their best intention. Because even if we end up with a great salesperson who says, oh, well, that $2,000 bonus is really designed to mess, mess over me, we've got to push through that and make sure they understand that we're in this for the long haul. And I, and I think I... I go to the beginning of the year, and I want to remind us about uh, all of our pledges to exercise more and to eat healthier and things of that nature. Well, the fact is, the most important thing is to start. And even if we just start small, and I learned this um, from an exercise book that I read, and I'm really good at reading the books. I'm just not good at doing the rest of the stuff after I read them. And the, and the guy in the uh, writing said, just start with one push-up a day. And I thought, well, that seems pretty simple. I can do that. And uh, what I've learned is if I can do one push-up a day, sometimes I can actually double it. And I end up and I'll do two push-ups, and, and my hope is that one day I'll be able to do three push-ups. So the point is, Wherever we go, we've got to really just get out there and start. And, and when we, we look at the challenges, we want to make sure that we know where we're going with this. So what I want to do is let's throw up that second poll question, and I want to see what's going on at the dealerships with regards to activity requirements. All right, you heard my friend David Kane. Second poll question is on your screen now. If you wouldn't mind, please let us know what's happening in your dealership. The question is, does your floor sales team currently have daily activity requirements? Please select one of the following answers. Yes, and we utilize daily checkouts. Yes, but it is not enforced. No, we don't, but we want to start. Or no, we don't, 
and we like it that way. So, does your floor sales team currently have daily activity requirements? We want to know what's happening at your dealership, and once we find out, we're going to close this poll and share the results, and then you'll know what's happening all over the country, all right? And audience, too, if you are... Uh, tweeting out, hey, I want to see them too. I didn't know he had 50 tweets out already. Kevin Fry, how come I'm not getting tagged in those? And, <laughs> and also, audience, if you have a question for today's amazing Dealer On presenter, don't hesitate to send it in. We will be holding those questions till the very end of the presentation, where we hope to have a very robust Q&A session with the one and only David Kane. Until that time, please send them on in. And let's close this poll and share the results. Man, my audience is on it today, David. You inspire greatness. That's all I can say. Here we go. All right, David. 29% of today's audience said yes, they do currently have daily activity requirements for their floor sales team, and they also utilize daily checkouts. That's almost a third of today's audience. But almost a half, 49%, said yes, they have it too but they don't enforce them. 18% of today's audience said no they don't, but they do want to start. And 4% says no they don't, and they like it that way. Does that help you out, David? That helps quite a bit. And I, I think uh, we all go through that. I know that when I was a sales manager, I had every intention to do my daily one-on-ones with the sales floor. And then a few minutes in, I'd get disrupted, uh, and or distracted, and then only one person any given day have their one-on-one. -on -one. And, and I, I know that all of us have these great intentions, but what we've really got to do is to work towards making the habit of doing um, things on a daily basis to drive great results. So I hate to be remedial here, but I'm going to pull some of the great information from the book, The Power of Habit, and talk about how to form a habit. Uh, in the book, they talk about the, the, the cycle starts with a cue. So let's just say, for example, the sales team comes to work. The BBC team goes to work. The routine is, and I know what it's like when I was a salesperson, the routine is we talk about sports, we talk about uh, customers, but we tend not to do what we do, and then the managers come around, they might push us back to our office, but within a few minutes we're back out there and the routine remains the same. And the reward is we still make pretty good money in the car business. Uh, sales are up, and, and that's the real power opportunity here, and I've seen it happen with really awesome dealerships is the time to grow is when the business is strong, but our, what our habits are is when the business gets strong, we tend to pare back our routines and, and we, we don't do the, the really strong things that keep business coming back through the door. So how long does it take to make a habit? Well, normally when we throw this question out, we'll get 21 times or 7 times or whatever it is. Well, there's a great uh, research study done by University College in London done by Philippa Lally. And Philippa established scientifically that in order to create a habit, it typically takes 66 times. 66? I'll give you an example. So wait, if I want to do 100 sit-ups and love doing them, I have to do it 66 times in a row before I actually make it a habit? That's a lot. Yeah, well, <laughs> interesting. I, I would uh, throw that word love out because doing that many... <laughs> Uh, I don't know whether or not we'll ever love them, and I doubt Philippa went that far. But the good news is even if you hate them, they're a habit, and it would be very difficult for you to break. But, but when, we, when we look at that, and, and we're all the time encouraging the use of video, because video is so compelling to customers, uh, and yet a week later, salespeople will come up and say, yeah, yeah, I tried it three or four times, and it didn't work. But those who create a habit of it, just really bear the fruit of that benefit. So keep that in mind. It takes a while. So where does the cue start? Well, back to the sales manager. If it is to be, it is up to me. So looking at this framework, imagine the result. If we could get a team to do 500 plus interactions with customers and prospects each and every month, what if we could pound that up at 50 a day 
and end up with 1,000 plus interactions a month. If we drew a big circle and we saw the dealership advertising and then let's say a floor team of 10 or 20 salespeople and all their interactions, you've got a very powerful dynamic to really push your position in the market. So moving from the queue to the routine, once again, starts back with the sales manager. And if we sit here and said our routine is not going to be uh, 10 a day, 25, but it's going to be 50 a day, then we'd eventually get there. But wherever you decide to start, that's what you need to do as your focal point each and every day. And of course, your sales team is going to say, well, this looks like a lot of work. Well, surprisingly, that's why uh, I enjoy when this uh, pilot friend of mine, he flew for Delta for a long time, and he came in and bought a lot of vehicles from me, and Roger Huffman was his name, and Roger said, the game of business is tough, and that's why they don't play it in short pants. And I think that's <laughs> accurate. And when you, when you look at the sales floor and you see so many people just hanging out and that lost productivity, imagine if they were emailing, telephoning, texting, chatting, doing video, writing letters, tweeting, uh, posting on LinkedIn, liking on Facebook, uh, you know, everything that we can do in the social environment on a regular basis, wow, what we could accomplish. So salespeople need a reward. And the reward, once again, goes back to the manager. And what we're advocating is the reward is intrinsic to the salesperson. And if I do 50 actions a day, I will definitely sell 20 vehicles a month, which will get me 240 sales a year just with simple math. And I'm probably the best salesperson in the dealership. And if I can get to that level and I really build great habits, imagine where I can go from there. And what we're encouraging dealerships to consider is an extra bonus for self-developed sales. And I've had people ask me on this and say, you know, um, how do you, do you even measure it? What's frustrating is, you know, if they come up to you, how do you audit it? People are going to cheat the system. Well, my, my counsel is figure it out. Get in a position to where you trust yourself. People work out a system that's, pretty foolproof, but leave yourself in a, in a position to where if somebody's doing a great job and you can prove it, give them the opportunity to make a percentage increase, a dollar increase, whatever that bonus amount would be, help them get some benefit back from going out there and generating their own business. So if you could, Eliana, I've got another poll question I'd like to ask. Let's do it. All right, audience, this is your third of four poll questions. Yeah, you got one more coming up after this, but this is a pretty interesting one. So we'd love to see your feedback on this. The question's on the screen now, and it is, does your dealership offer additional earnings when salespeople generate their own business? Please select one of the following answers. No, we do not. It's part of their job. No, but maybe it's something we should try. Yes, and it works well for us. Yes, but we don't see much benefit. We want to know, does your dealership currently offer, uh, you know, what do they call them, spiffs, you know, rewards, additional earnings of any kind, when salespeople generate their own business? Once we get a majority of those votes in, we're going to close the poll and share the results. Very interesting what I'm seeing coming in, audience. I love that you guys are getting involved. Thank you so much. I know David thanks you as well. And David, I don't know if you're going to be surprised by these results or not. i got to be honest. I don't know. You've, you've asked this question before, I assume. Yes, I have. Okay. All right. Um, and, uh, yeah, somebody wrote in, it seems like the reward would be in their paycheck. Well, all right, all right. Well, let's see what David can. I mean, he does this more than all of us, I think. So, audience, thank you so much for your votes. We really appreciate it. I'm going to close this poll and share those results. Here we go. 47% of today's audience said no. They do not currently offer additional earnings when salespeople generate their own business. They feel it's part of their job. That's 47%, David. Almost, almost as much. 44% also said no, but you know what? Maybe it's something we should try. 
And there you have that. Now, 3% of today's audience said yes, and it's working well for them. And 6% of today's audience said yes, but we don't see much benefit. David, any, mm. any response to that? Oh, that's what I was saying. Like when you've asked this before, is this in line with what you've seen or heard? It's completely in line. And, and what what is the real challenge to it is, we'll pay a third party company to generate leads for us, but we won't reward our own team to go out there in the public and and help grow the business. So, ah, um, interesting. That's something point. that we need to come to terms with. And I agree with the fact that yes, it is part of the business, but then when we don't. Uh, inspire them every day to come to work, to really work. I think that's one of the key issues is if, if it's going to be part of their job, then literally make the managers make it part of their job each and every time that they clock in. So how can we make all this happen? And that's always the, the real special element here is getting it out in front of the sales team and making them want to do this, getting the BDC team involved as well. So I think it comes to updating the team work habits. And sales managers will say, I need a new or perhaps a better trained team. Well, I, I tend to lean towards a better trained team because we've got a curse of ridiculous turnover in our industry. And a lot of salespeople wouldn't have to work bell to bell if we could train them to be business developers for themselves. They literally could set their own hours. We could close the doors at 5 or 6 p.m. because we've done enough business in a regular day. And, and we're all the time talking about the day that, boy, I hope I don't have to take any more ups. Well, boss, teach me how to do that, and I'll do that. So we've got to quit telling them and start showing them. So what we've learned is there's two dealership types out there, and we run into them every week. There's the can dealership. And they're listening on this webinar and they're saying, well, shoot, we can do that. And then there's the camp dealership that equally is saying, we can't do that at our store because of this. Well, you know where success comes from and it really emanates from a group that says, no matter what the barriers are, we can do this and we're going to do this. So what we recommend you do is to create or hire the CAN team with a strong emphasis on create. These are the employees that you work with right now. And I always think it's funny when I go to uh, uh, iStock Photo and I get these team pictures and they never look like the sales team that I managed or what we see in dealership. <laughs> but I always imagine that all of us wish that our floor team looked this uh, successful and dynamic. But the fact is they can when we expect that of them and we need to create that environment at our store. So the phonics of this, and I'm really hooked on the phonics of making this work. And I know that when I was coming up to the dealership, uh, my father taught us a concept of de developing circles of influence. And we're really great at this in the car business, but we sometimes don't make the list. So I would encourage having a meeting real soon, maybe tomorrow or this afternoon, where we ask our sales team to sit down and make a list of all their friends and how they can communicate with them by text, by email, by social media. And then uh, look at your customers. Get a list of who their repeat customers are. A lot of, a lot of sales people nowadays with all the electronics don't subset who their customers are. And they, they forget this. I worked with a fellow named Jack O'Nan for several years. And Jack worked at our dealership. And as I said, we've been in business since 1952. And Jack worked there about 30 years. And he had a binder with a copy of every buyer's order he ever sold. What? And it was amazing. And I was like, oh, man, I need to do that. And what we're finding nowadays is salespeople don't even know who their customers are. So we get that big circle. Then we look at our coworkers, and people are like, well, that's salespeople. Well, it's also technicians. It's lot of tenants. It's office workers. It's body shop technicians. All those people who are coworkers that never have anybody come up to them and say, hey, when you have somebody interested in the car, would you send them to me? Our neighbors, people who we live next door sometimes don't even know we sell cars. And then, of course, last but not least, our social networks. So we should make a list 
of where all those opportunities are and start figuring out a methodology for communicating with these people on an ongoing basis. And then we've got to develop an exceptional CRM culture. And oftentimes when I go into a CRM, we rarely see notes like this. And I remember when I had the three by five index cards in my, my plastic Tom Stuker box, if you will, and it was interesting that every customer that came in, when they left, I made notes. And, and I knew everything about them. But we just do not see that uh, in today's environment. You go into a CRM and it's normally like uh, customers a slug, uh, you know, couldn't get the deal done, uh, too high of expectations, um, and, and cursory notes that don't, when, when the customer calls back in, afford us the opportunity to say something personal to them. So what we're remembering is the more you know about your clients, the better you can help them, and of course, in turn, you'll help yourself. And I, I learned this from a, a good long-term client and personal friend of mine, Terry Moore, with Reed Lallier Chevrolet. And he said, CRM doesn't mean customer relationship management as we all suspect it means. He says he feels like CRM really stands for customer remembers me. <laughs> and if we care about our customer, then they will remember us, and we've got to bear that in mind. So the other thing is we've got to realize that great salespeople have to be great marketers. And my father told me a pretty whopper of a story when I first uh, started working with the story. He said, every day you're going to be a salesperson, and you'll be selling cars on the floor. And I thought, this is great. I'm really, really looking forward to that. But the truth of the matter is only about 10% of the time was I able to be selling whereas 90% of the time I had to be marketing. And I couldn't rely on the newspaper ad, radio ad, TV ad, or nowadays the website and all of the SEO, SEM, and third-party leads, and TrueCar, and all those things out there, I had to generate on my own. And it makes a huge difference. So sales managers in some stores, their learning curve is really steep for this because they bypassed it. And they said, well, I'm a... I'm a one-dimensional person. I just work deals when people come in. Well, today's sales manager, my challenge to them is you've got to learn how all this works, and you can't just hope that you've got a team in the BDC that's going to make it happen. You've got to oversee it and be the sales manager for the whole dealership, not just for customers who come in the door. I also think that dealerships need to implement social selling. I can't tell you how many times I go into a store and it's been within the last two weeks where dealership principals have said, how do we shut down Facebook and all those other social things that are going on on our floor because it's hurting our ability to sell cars? Well, that's just crazy. And Dale Carnegie published in 1937 his famous book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And what we've got to do is leverage his real foundational learning and make sure that we get our team out there social selling. And, and one of the best things that we can do is have them participate in items like forums. That's where customers go to talk about products and, and inquire and trade ideas. And what we've seen is real progressive salespeople will actually hang out on those forums and look for when this kind of a post comes up or perhaps this post, or perhaps this post, where they're in a position where now they're a friend of the people on the exchange, and now they can actually um, gently prod them, help them, cajole them into wanting cons to consider them when they want to buy a vehicle. It's amazing how effective that works when you're trying to sell to a friend. Additionally, we've got all these social platforms, but Everybody is telling me, man, we just really haven't cracked the code and figured out how to sell cars on this. Well, truth of the matter is mostly we just sell cars on the showroom floor. We sometimes sell cars on the phone, but to a large degree, all of this is a marketing platform, and we need to realize that this is where we build our friends and build our influence. And we've got to create some daily social habits. We can 
tweet out some interesting product info, endorse friends, like people, and their post on, on Facebook. I know just even last night, I, I endorsed some people, several people on LinkedIn. And just on, on characteristics that they put up there, and then today I ended up with about 20 people who wanted to uh, become friends or link in on LinkedIn. The influence circle grows daily if we fuel it daily, and we don't even have to post stuff. Sometimes all we have to do is like, comment, or whatever we'd want to do on their post. And it's all part of creating a daily social habit. Additionally, something that we're advocating is each and every day, the dealership should have a daily social hour. We, we have happy hour. We have uh, get on the phone and let's have some pizza and let's call a lot of people. But I believe it would be awesome if whether it's 10 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour, have a management-led social hour to where the manager goes in, puts the message of the day on the board and says, let's tweet this out, let's post this on Facebook, let's go like some, some posts of your clients, go out there and uh, endorse some of your customers, uh, connect with your customers on LinkedIn, invite them to um, be engaged with what you're posting out there and just be part of your network. And the social hour can really turn into a fun and dynamic opportunity for the dealership to increase the presence uh, in the social environment. Ooh, that generated a lot of buzz. A ton of people just wrote in. Great suggestion, Mr. Kane. Thank you for that, <laughs> Sir Kane. Daily social hour was an awesome idea. I love that cool. idea. So thank you for that one. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Sometimes we need the tools to do it, and uh, today's CRM tools really fall short when it comes to allowing salespeople to do good customer communications. So I'll, I'll put out this um, idea, and our company uses a social CRM called Nimble, and they offer it free to anybody. So any individual can sign up for this, and I would encourage dealerships to suggest to their team to leverage social CRM and get their sales team to leverage Nimble so that on a daily basis I get a notice and it says here's my top contacts and it says is this contact important and if I say yes it will tell me to communicate in a week or on a weekly basis, monthly basis, uh, quarterly or yearly and, and then it shows up. As you can see on, on the screen, uh, it talks about engagement opportunities, and I've got Kevin Fry and Brian Pash and uh, Alexi and Jared and Jordan Lampert, Tim Jackson. These are the people that show up in my social stream, and all I have to do is to go in and engage with them and keep them coming up. And it makes a huge difference when we have the right tools in place to do that. Uh, you can even leverage Nimble into your current CRM uh, with some, some nice little technical updates, so keep that in mind. There's also tools that are being developed, such as uh, the ChatterUp product. And I like ChatterUp because what it will do is, in a very refined way, it will go out and find tweets in your marketplace where customers are putting out posts that I need a new car, uh, I'm out car shopping, and ultimately, what we're able to do is engage with those people. Maybe what all we do is follow, retweet, or we can even reply. It's not a time to try to sell them something, but it is a good time to build your social connectivity. Because ultimately, we've got to pay attention to the buying signs, and rarely are they this obvious. And I wish they were. <laughs> I'm sure everyone wishes they, are like, they were. I mean, I know that when I was a salesperson, the guy that didn't buy the car was the one that walked in the showroom and said, I'm going to buy a car today. We almost ran from those people because they never did. We have to nurture buyers and, and uh, influence them to want to come around to our way of thinking. The other thing that I really want to push out there is my father had a really great idea that when we started working in the dealership, we had to become engaged in our community. And if you go into dealerships today and you say, um, do you all, 
are you all going to chamber meetings? Are you all part of Kiwanis or the, the Lions Club or the Rotary? Very rarely does a dealership have anything like that set up. So what we encourage uh, is for the dealership to join those clubs. And I remember one of our best things we did at our store was we became a member of the Home Builders Association and the Kentucky Thoroughbred Farm Managers Club. And we participated. We had them out to the dealership. We'd go to their events. And once we became friends with these guys, they were the ones that bought vehicles from us. So I would encourage your dealership team to really get out there and become active in the community in whatever brand of what you sell. Mustang clubs, Jeep clubs, mini clubs, there's all kinds of things out there that you can develop, but definitely get involved uh, in, a, in a real important way. And, and I would start looking at your team and saying, what do you do in the community? How are you engaged? Are you uh, building homes? Uh, are you helping out with charities? Are you are involved in anything? And, and quit trying to get them to put in FaceTime at the dealership. Let them have FaceTime out in the community and put yourself out there as a dealership and support their work. Now, if we get friends and we have family and we want to bring them to a website, what I would really encourage you to do is to create a friends, family, and partner website. And certainly I hope that uh, Ali and Amir are listening to this and we're able to get dealer uh, on to put together a program for all of you who are on the, on the call today to where we can all create these friends and family type environment. Just like Dealer On has led the way in creating service websites for dealerships, I think this is a wonderful niche opportunity for them to work with dealerships to create an environment where I can say to somebody, hey, listen, um, you're a friend of mine. Go to this website. It's not a regular website. Here's a, here's a way to get in. Here's a code. And, and afford them an opportunity to go get a little special deal or some sort of a benefit that way. I really see that as a great way to leverage technology to your benefit. So Eliana, if we could, go we'll ask the final poll question. Oh, let's do that. All right, audience, your last poll question of the day is on the screen now. We want to know, does your dealership currently have a website for friends and family members. Please select one of the following options. No, what would we use it for? We don't have friends. <laughs> no, but it's a good idea. Yes, but we don't leverage it as we should. Or yes, we do a great job with it. We want to know. Once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close this poll and share the results. So, do you have anything that you do for your friends and family members, but specifically, do you have a website for that? No. What would we use it for? We don't have friends. No, but it seems like it would be a good idea. Yes, but we admit we don't leverage it as much as we should. Or, yeah, we do a really great job with it. I have to tell you, David, I've never heard of this idea. <laughs> well, I'm sure you all will write me a check and send it to me, so that's a great one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't wait to see this. Okay, uh, let's see now. By the way, audience, we're getting some wonderful questions in from the audience, David. So uh, prepare to have a very robust Q&A session coming on. Um, and <laughs> i got all kinds of stuff happening here. Okay, audience, thank you so much for your answers. David, I think you might be maybe a little bit surprised by these answers. But we're going to close this poll and share the results right now. And yeah, 89% of today's audience said no, but that's a good idea. Let's see what happened with the remaining 11%. Uh, 4% 4 said no, what would we use that for? We don't have any friends. 5% said yes, but we don't leverage it as we should. And only 1%, 1% said yes. And we do a great job with it. Does that help you out, Dave? Yeah, that's great. And uh, certainly is a good opportunity for you all to get out there and, and create an environment to where you can uh, whisper in people's ears, send links, and uh, try to encourage your influenced customers to come back and share that with other people. So a couple more things, and then we'll move to the q and A. I I think we've got to update our work setting. And a lot of us need to consider the fact that we need a new up system. 
and we have salespeople and we've got managers that are all the time putting the noses on the front window of the store and saying, watch the lot. Well, that's okay and I think we've got to realize that we have this going on a lot when we have the managers forcing us out the door. So what we want to do is to go from this to this to where we have the BDC team share office space with salespeople or something to this effect and we create a real professional environment to start the day. And I know a lot of dealerships are in a position to where they already have salespeople start the day in the BDC or in some sort of a business development environment and they can't go to the floor until they've got appointments. And I'm not necessarily advocating that, but I believe if we created a daily work habit and gave them the space and the professional direction, and this has got to be a supervised environment to make sure everybody knows what they are needing to do, it would make a huge difference in the dealership environment. And I also am a, a big advocate of an electronic up system. I think they work really well and they allow people to be focused when they're at work. And I know that um, when, we, when we create this environment where we come to work to work, it's something that we have to get used to as managers. You know, when I was growing up, I worked at Rand McNally Book Factory one summer. And I know that when I logged in at 3 o'clock, and I got off at 11, they, they had my total attention. And when I was uh, loading books on a pallet in the uh, factory, if the, the machine went down, I didn't get to go hang out. I had to actually pick up a broom and, and go back to work and do something productive. And I believe, unfortunately, in today's sales environment, we hold the BDC accountable to a high standard of performance. We're measuring all their calls, all their activities, and so on and so forth. And then you look out in the same dealership on the sales floor, and we've got salespeople just hanging out. And that's not their fault. That's our fault. And we've got to change that environment. We also need a, a new write-up sheet so we understand how we can get social. And we start asking customers, what's your Twitter handle? And are you on LinkedIn? Do you follow on any brand enthusiast forums? Get, start learning where your customers are hanging out, and then start engaging with them. We're starting to see dealerships when someone leaves in their new vehicle, they'll tweet out, thanks a lot you know, to the customer uh, for coming in and buying this new vehicle. Here's a picture. And letting the customer understand that we are socially engaged. Additionally, we've got to update our tool selection at the store and go mobile so that salespeople can take a photograph, they can leverage it on the floor, and let's start communicating with our CRM out of the mobile environment and really connecting better socially with our customer on those tools. Also, we had a, um, Eliana, we operate two Internet BDC Manager 20 groups, and we're getting ready to open up our very first Digital Marketing Manager 20 group. And what's cool about it is we have these uh, best idea sessions, and we meet three times a year, and the best idea for one of our groups was this uh, where you can do a I snap photo booth in the delivery bay uh, and take a picture with the team and, and there's a lot of different ways to do this so I'm not endorsing one brand over another but what happens is now the customer gets to post it on their social network right there at the dealership instead of the dealership posting it and then hoping the customer will post it on their page so this gives the customer the opportunity right there at delivery to do that and that won the best idea at that particular uh, session. We also have to do daily training and CRM checkouts. And you know the fact is, most of us would say we've been meaning to do this, but we don't necessarily do that. So if we'll get to that point, we can truly blend the floor and the BDC and truly create a business development dealership. So no fear, if you're operating the BDC, pat yourself on the back, you're doing a great job. If you would then move to a business development dealership, I promise you, you will awaken the sleeping giant within and really make your dealership powerful in 2015. So our key takeaways, once again, create your BDD. Make sure that you create the activity habit in your store. Make it a success habit. Get the CAN team working for you. Develop your own team and make them the CAN team. 
I would also encourage rewarding salespeople for uh, generating business. And then, of course, have a daily social hour and expect each team member to be socially successful. So, Eliana, that's really all I had to cover today. And a lot of people are probably wondering what else is out there and where else can I pick up stuff. I'll do just a quick endorsement. Um, we did open up Kane University at the beginning of the year. And uh, that's something that I would encourage any, anybody on the phone to consider uh, checking out. Uh, join our idea exchange. We've got 3,000 active members who are exchanging ideas on a daily basis. And then, of course, you can always contact our training team, and we will be glad to answer any questions and help you any way we can. I want I want a cartoon of myself. That's cute. Okay. <laughs> well, just so you know, Joe is one of the many people on here who says. I want in. That sounds like a great idea. And um, we're hearing from a lot of people on that. So uh, if you want to learn more, of course, you can always go to KaneAutomotive.com um, and also Kane University. And yeah, audience, if you haven't sent in your questions yet, I don't know what you're waiting for. We have a lot of questions that already came in. And we're going to be getting to those in just a moment. But we have a little bit of business to take care of. It's that time. If you missed it at the beginning of the webinar, well, I announced that our good friends at Kane Automotive are giving away an awesome prize today on the webinar. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to be winning one month of unfettered access to Kane Automotive's online university. This prize is valued at $895. It is a tremendous prize for your dealership, and it even you even have access to their exclusive Eight Steps to Internet Success module. That's only one of them, by the way. There's plenty, plenty others that are in there as well that you're going to have access to. So if you want to win this, well, now's the time. Get ready. Get to your keyboards. First person to write in the correct response is going to be winning this amazing prize today. Here we go. Good luck, everyone. I want to ask any vendors who are out there, please sit this one out. This is a prize intended only for dealership personnel who would like to try out this offering from Kane Automotive Risk Free. We would ask that you please sit this out and leave it for those dealership personnel. All right. Thank you very much for that. Audience, here I know. Look, <laughs> what? Yes. Sit it out, babe. Okay. Dealership personnel, here you go. Here's your question. It's not an easy question. I hope you were paying attention. Earlier, David described the circles of influence for salespeople to use when doing their own business development. I want you to name at least four of them. You have to name four of them. It's a big prize, so of course he made it a little hard. So David described the circles of influence for salespeople. We need four of them. Uh, when doing your own business development. Okay, we got a lot of answers in. Let's see who has the right answer. Okay. Friends, friends of friends, neighbors, co-workers. There we go. We have a winner. Our very first person who had four of, let me see. Oh, my goodness. I love that you guys are writing in so much. Oh, my gosh, I have so many people to look at here. Um. Friends, coworkers, neighbors, customers. That's the winner, Scott Keeler. You are the first person who wrote in a correct response. He wrote in friends, co. Wait, is that right? Friends. Oh no, coworkers isn't one of them. Is coworkers one of? Them? No, it's not. Oh, I take it back, Scott. I'm sorry, you're not a winner. <laughs> oh God, I'm no, terrible. No, it is. It is. It coworkers is one. Is one. Okay. Yeah. Um, friends, co-workers, neighbors, customers is what Scott Keeler wrote in. That would work. That'll work. All right. Scott Keeler, you're our winner today. Congratulations. Please write in and let me know what dealership you're from. Thank you so much. Let's see. No, he didn't write in yet. That was a great, great prize. And just so you know, we would have also accepted social networks and family members. 
So there's lots of people that you guys can be using to increase your own business development. And Scott Keeler wrote in, he's from Murdoch Auto Group in Utah. Congratulations, Scott. You won a tremendous prize for your dealership. It is one month of free access to Kane Automotive's online university. Fast fingers for you, man. You're the first person to write in, and you did have the correct answer. Thank you, everyone, for playing along. Congratulations to Scott Keeler and his dealership, Murdoch Auto Group in Utah. And, of course, we want to also thank our good friends at Kane Automotive for their incredible generosity. And before we get to the questions, David, I also wanted to let the audience know that you have these amazing micro-workshops coming up. Now, they are going to be hosted in Lexington, Kentucky. And as you can see, we actually have a few of them that are coming up in February, not to mention a couple of them in March. And what's great about these, if you've never been to one of these, is um, they're, they're micro-workshops. They're about, you know, like 12 to 15, no more than you know, like 18 people in a workshop, so you really get that one-on-one -on -one training from David. So, um, David, did you want to say anything else about this before we move on to the questions? Well, just just that um, in this environment where everything is big and, and uh, to host an event and to be small, people sometimes have challenged us and said, why would you have these itty-bitty micro-workshops? And we're at a position with our business to where we're doing well and our environment is we want to have a, a good training experience for the people who come into town and, and we host them in Lexington, Kentucky and it's in an old school building. That's where our office is. So it's a cool environment. The floors are a little creaky because they're old wooden and we always imagine the days where the kids were in here learning and uh, what we've created is a really wonderful training environment uh, and have made an investment uh, from a technology standpoint to make it a really rich opportunity for people to come in and learn process tactics and digital marketing. Uh, that's fantastic. And if you haven't taken advantage of it, you know, maybe you should check it out. It's at KaneAutomotive.com. You can check out more information there. All right, David, we have so many great questions from the audience. We must get to them now. Are you ready? I am ready. Okay. Very first question came in quite early. This one came from Dave. And Dave says, is it fair for salespeople to expect to have access to incoming leads? I thought that was a great question. Is it fair? I mean, or do you, I mean, how would you do it in if you owned a dealership? Well, you do own a dealership. <laughs> well, I am a partner in our family's dealership, so that's a great question. And my encouragement is, um, and I'll go ahead and turn on the camera, Eliana. Oh, I'm great. Uh, a little dressed down today because we've got cold weather and uh, rare snow here in Kentucky. But anyway, I wanted to say that uh, I think it's fair for salespeople to be able to work leads. Uh, they're salespeople. And, and think ultimately you have to depend on what the structure is at your dealership. So if, if the salespeople have not um, become digitally oriented, I would encourage them to become so. Uh, the dealership should offer training opportunities. And certainly if I'm in a position where I can prove I have the skills and the knowledge and the uh, capability to effectively manage Internet leads, then I would, I would say that's a fair opportunity for everyone. But you've got to look at the structure in your store, and that's an in-store uh, question that needs to be answered at your store. I love it. Dave, if you have a follow-up question, please write on in and let us know. Okay, um, I, a lot of people are asking about um, the uh, slide deck and the webinar recording. We are recording this, and if you'd like a copy of the slide deck, please email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. I think I told you all earlier, but my computer's not very happy right now, but I'm going to try my best to get those out to you uh, by close of business today, at the very least by tomorrow, okay? I uh, hope to hear from you about that. That's eliana at dealeron.com. All right, David, next question comes to you from Andrew. He says, in your mind, in your opinion, is it possible to do this in an open floor environment without an up system? So same kind of question, I guess. Yeah, I think uh, all of this can be done without technology. I want to go back to the very first CRM that I worked with when I was a salesperson. I was going to school at the University of Tennessee, and our CRM was a blackboard, and we used chalk. 
and the manager three times a day would have us come in as salespeople and make us go through who we were working and what was going on. Um, sadly, back then, because if we didn't sell them when they were there, uh, we just kind of wrote them off. Um, back in the early 80s, he would erase them, and then we'd start over. So we'd bring in our notes that were on our business cards the next day, and we'd start over on that chalkboard. So yes, it can be done. It can be done with a tick sheet. It can be done with whatever. My concern with an open floor is when someone does uh, pop onto the lot from an appointment, tends, tends to distract other salespeople who don't know they're coming in, and they rush to the floor as an opportunity. So I think it's important to create the right work environment and put salespeople in a position where they can really focus on the task at hand, which is making phone calls, sending text messages, chatting with customers, uh, writing letters, and of course sending emails. So I would encourage to have a system by which salespeople know when they are in the routine to where they have to dig in and do business development. Got you, got you. All right, Andrew, great question. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Steven's going to put you on the spot now. Are you ready? <laughs> Yeah. Stephen wants to know, how do you get the floor sales team to do their daily activities? David? <laughs> well, so the, the, the uh, challenge is appointing the right person as the manager. And if the manager can influence the team to behave correctly, then that's a good manager. But in today's environment, we have so few managers who have really been trained to be managers we uh, elevate them into their role, but we oftentimes don't give them the education to really successfully uh, execute the role. So I would, I would say that it's always the manager, and if the manager can't get the team to do it, then you've probably got the wrong manager. And uh, it's got to have the backing of the administration of the store, be it the general manager or dealer principal, and they need to back up the manager who's holding the team accountable. Interesting. Dean had a follow-up question to Steve's, kind of on the same gear. He says, what's the secret to get our sales staff to commit to 50 actions a day? Do you think that's the right amount, David? Is 50 a lot? Is it a little? Oh, 50 is a lot. <laughs> yeah, I mean, 50 is a lot, but if you look at a BDC, a lot of the agents are tasked with on a daily basis to do 100 activities. And so salespeople who don't have um, appointments and who don't have a busy sales floor with business that they've generated need to be doing the same type of activity. So I was in a 20 group the other day and this uh, general manager of the store said, well, we'll run out of opportunities. And I, I didn't even have to answer the question myself. He said, in our CRM, at 50 a day, we would run out of people pretty quickly. And then the dealer principal at another store said, that's hogwash. He said, we never run out of opportunities. We are chock full of uh, orphans, uh, service customers, uh, customers in equity, customers who are moving into your market. Uh, the dealership needs to go out there and effectively create the opportunities and create the list, if you will, for salespeople. But once we build that habit and salespeople just get that ingrained in them, then we're really going to rock on this. I got you. Dean, thank you so much. Okay. Small, remember, one push-up a day, right? One push-up a day? All right, if you think it's going to help me, one push-up a day. <laughs> All right, Dean, thank you so much. Great question. If you have another one, please write on in. Now, I'm going to give a shout-out to Adam Lee. He wrote me a book for you, David. So I'm going to save that one for a little bit. Let's get through some of these other ones that came through. Um, for instance, well, one of the things that Adam said is it's interesting how it's 2015, and we're really just talking about getting back to relationship sales of the pre-technology age, but by using the modern tech tools of the ultra high tech era. Ha ha ha, I love it. And Ralph seemed to agree with you. He says, great webinar. I love that it's taking us back to the basics that all great salespeople were doing before BDCs with all of the great technology and social media and community involvement. And how could one not be successful? So I guess the question here is, do you need to use technology to be successful as a salesperson in a BC, BDC or BDD or however you want to put it? Absolutely. Uh, customers demand it. It's the greatest way to have connectivity. 
we can go out and do all the handshaking and the friend making, but if we don't have a way to communicate the way most customers want to communicate today, we're only doing part of the equation. We've got to do the full circle. I love that. Okay, um, when talking about compensation, David, we did generate a few comments and questions there. For instance, Brian says, unfortunately, bird dogging is illegal in Virginia, so that's not something that he might be able to use where he is. But Joe wrote in, so then compensation should be for business generated as opposed to cars sold for those in a traditional BDC? We currently pay the coordinators for cars sold and a small amount for appointments shown. What do you feel works best? Well, so in a BDC environment, that's really not what I'm uh, concentrating on. So a BDC environment, just by its nature, is, is different than what we're talking about. We're mostly focusing on the BDD environment, on the floor salespeople who are standing around and not actively pursuing business development, getting them in a position to where they'll leverage their, their customers and their coworkers, their friends, their networks to generate business back in. However, I do have some great ideas about BDC compensation. I'd be glad to share those in another forum. Oh, really? Because Robert wrote in and he said, well, what's an example of a great reward plan for compensating staff for generating their own leads? I mean, how do you separate it? from their standard commission. Is that a question you'd want to address here or maybe some other time? Yeah, I would be glad to. I think that's a, a little more complicated for just the few minutes that we're going to have here. But what, in simple terms, if it's a floor salesperson and at the end of any month they are able to establish that they generated uh, business that came directly from their own marketing efforts, their engagement with the uh, groups that they work with, uh, maybe it's Habitat for Humanity, maybe it's a charity that they participate with, church members, people who, who come through that way. And I, if I'm a manager, I'm going to skew in favor of someone who is able to demonstrate to me that each day they come in, they do 25, 30, 40, 50 activities every day. I'm going to figure out a way to reward them at, over and above what they normally make, whether it be a 1% bump, a 2 5%, whatever that is. I want to figure out a way to where they know that we've got their back and we're going to reward them for helping generate business back to the store. I love that. All right. Um, what does that mean? Somebody wrote in spoons. I have no idea what that means. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, Robert also wanted to know, what specifically is an electronic up system? Do you have an example? Yeah. There's. Um, one that we've got several clients using called SkyUps. Um, then there's another one called the Next Up. There's several of them. I would Google it, dealership electronic up system, and uh, check it out. Run them through the uh, uh, question and answers and make sure that it's something that you would want to work with. <laughs> I love these questions that are coming in for you, David. It is. Okay, um, thank you so much for that. Um, let's get to, I'm, Adam, you hold in there with me. I know, I'm going to get, I'm leaving yours for last because it's a really, really long question, okay? Um, uh, Steve says, Steve wrote in, what do you think about sales staff rotating through the BDC department? Is it BDD worthy? If so, how long do you feel each shift should be? I love that idea. Uh, it's part of the crawl, walk, run process, if you will. Uh, if you go to most BDCs, you've got some empty chairs and empty cubicles. Uh, I would just each day station them in there, maybe start with an hour, two hours, build up their endurance. But ultimately, it can't be unsupervised, and um, you can't be disruptive to the BDC work, workflow that's already taking place. Um, we've got to really work to put this system in. And, and I think it's a behavioral issue, and, and being a man I can say this, a lot of times uh, if you will put uh, men in a work environment with women, the, the men tend to want to uh, socialize while the women are working. And, and I think that's why you need to really put in a strong manager who gets the team to work in that environment. And, and I believe it's really critical that we professionalize it. And if we bring the team back there, they understand that that's a work 
environment and they need to concentrate on the task at hand. Great question, Steve. Great answer, David. Okay, uh, another David wrote in, and this David says, I like a lot of what David presented today, but I am getting hung up on the aspect of incentivizing, above and beyond their commission checks, salespeople to do the job that they were hired to do. So when did it become okay for people to expect to get extra spiffs for doing the job that they are hired to do in the first place? Am I just a little old school in this respect, David? No, I don't think I don't think he's old school at all. When when I was hired in 1982, that was our job requirement. But if you look at salespeople nowadays, uh, and I've sat in on several interviews, the dealership managers that do the hiring oftentimes will say, "We have a BDC environment. When you come in, all we're going to ask you to do is present the product, test drive with the customer, close with the manager." And every day we're going to have appointments that are on the board, so you will really just specialize in that environment. So my question back would be, that your dealership, is that part of the job description that they do business development? And if, in fact, it is, then I would agree with you. But in most dealerships that we are coming into contact with, very seldom are salespeople really expected to do business development. And if it is, it's more... Uh, by happenstance as opposed to part of their job. But at the same point, sometimes we got to prime the pump to get this activity going. So we're, we're all the time signing up for new programs, new ideas, SEO, SEM, all those words that kind of are hitting us each and every week. Why don't we give a little money to our employees for doing their part of it and enrich them in such a way to where they want to be loyal and the longer they work there, the more they are attuned to the needs of the dealership. So invest in your employees and make the difference there. Okay, so David wrote back in and he says we don't have a BDC. So I guess my question in extension to David's is if, if, if a dealership doesn't have a BDC, does that make this extra spiff you know, for salespeople more important? in order to get to that BDD thing, you know, that nirvana that we're trying to achieve? <laughs> no, it doesn't make it more important. It's, it should be in both environments. The fact of the matter is, if we don't create an environment where the whole floor understands that I walked in the door today and my responsibility to myself, to my family, to my dealership is to generate business, then um, we're, we're giving the wrong impression. What we're really, what I'm really focusing on, and the and the drum that I'm beating here is, if you've got someone who's doing an extraordinary job, half their business, 75% of their business, 100% of their business comes from their own development, give them a spiff. I'm not talking about thousands of dollars. Let them be recognized. Maybe you just give them a trophy. Shoot, show show yourself what you can do with very little. Uh, Give them a piece of paper with a certificate that says leader uh, on the floor for generating business. Start small. Don't get hung up on the fact that you've got to compensate. It is amazing to me how, how many managers will write a check to some company to put fake ink on a letter and drop it in the mail to 10,000 people, and we won't go to our own sales floor and say, you did a great job. That was your neighbor that bought a vehicle from me. I'm going to give you an extra 50 bucks. Step up and take care of your team. That's all I'm, all I'm asking for. Boom. Well, you know what? I think you have a convert over here. David wrote back in. He said, fair enough, David. All right. Oh, and Adam wrote, amen. <laughs> Mr. Kane, preach it. Millennials don't care squat for bonus money as much as they love recognition. All right. <laughs> All right, so um, I'm going to finally get to Adam's, he wrote a book, this Adam. Adam, you're killing me here. I can't read this whole thing, can you? All right, um, <laughs> he says sorry. Um, all right, I'm going to start by reading this, and we'll see, we'll see where it winds up. So here's what Adam had to say. Who are some active dealers who are willing to share their BDD or hybrid success stories with others, specifically as a major CRM process and all platform integration guru, I would love to discuss or, you know, 
maybe steal, the great process ideas that are already working in similar dealerships who are a few steps ahead of us but share the same culture dream as we do. More specifically, we're hoping that other dealers are thinking about customer touches the same way we are, right message, right person, right time, and concerned, obviously, about customers getting too many messages because of bulky and non-logical processes. For example, my protege just inherited a Honda store where he's finding that his customers receive as many as 20, yes, 20 emails from the CRM because of goofy sales processes being touched by a non-cohesive sales department, service department, and a BDC as well. That's something he would like to avoid. Okay, there's like twice as much more that he wrote. <laughs> <laughs> but I think in the, yeah, in the, I would, the I essence, I would turn it down this way to say that yeah. the, the BDD, the hybrid, whatever you'd want to call it, is something that's new. Um, there are some really seasoned dealers out there who are probably very successful with whatever you'd want to call it. Um, I coined the phrase business development dealership uh, to play off the popularity of BDC because it's a natural extension and it's going above and beyond that. And I really was concerned with the uh, atrophy that was occurring on the sales floor when it comes to business development and the fact that sales managers to a large degree today don't really participate at the level that they used to. So there's probably people that you could post on a forum who would be willing to share that. Our internet BDC manager 20 groups, these are common topics that we work on and uh, we've got uh, meetings coming up the next couple of weeks with our two groups, and, uh, and we'll, be, we'll be tackling this really hard. So uh, I would get active on the forums, Adam, and, and start looking for people who would advocate. You can join our idea exchange. We'll be glad to help you that way as well. Uh, Adam wrote back in. He said, already done, and he already uh, enrolled in the Kane Automotive University. And I just want you to know, Adam, Karis wrote in, Karis has uh, been on our many of our webinars. She says, Adam, go to one of David's micro workshops. It's well worth it. All right. So uh, there's a, a little plug in there for that. And he says, deal. All right, Adam, there you go. And um, Tony also wrote in for you, Adam. He says, uh, well, first he says, David, thank you for an outstanding presentation. I couldn't agree more. You're always right on target. And I just want to go on record as saying that I have built a BDC based on an outstanding study that I read back in 2011. It was called 2011 Automotive Internet Study and the Role of Independent Internet Leads. Once again, thanks again, David. You rock. That one came from Tony. And... Um, uh, oh, Dean says, have him call me. I've been doing this for 13 years. Hybrid for eight. <laughs> You're Dean. You're awesome, so sweet. Dean. Good Thank, job, you. Buddy. Thank you so much, Dean. Um, and uh, let me see. Oh, we do have one other question that came in from Robert. He says, how can you realistically identify that uh, salespeople have developed their own business? <laughs> I don't want to give up on this, Eliana, but it is just amazing that we get hung up on this. Figure it out. Start, start the process. It will, it will be enlightening when you get to see it. I promise they will cheer. They will stand on top of their desk. They will do cartwheels in the showroom when they do their own business. It's amazing how effective it is and be there to champion their cause. I think you'll be astonished. I think, I think you might be surprised as well. All right, Robert. Thank you so much for that question. Before we go, I have to say, Bobby, I've got to give Bobby Heron a shout out. He's from Garber. He says, I'm on the road. I'm on a road trip to visit one of our stores, and I'm still attending the webinar on mobile through my Bluetooth, and I'm so glad I did. This was a great webinar. Um, and Joe also said, finally, David Kane. I'm holding a workshop on how to win at carnival games. Are you in? Apparently he saw you at the AT&T party at NADA doing the carnival games. <laughs> I need all the help I can get. <laughs> you got it. Oh, Rick McCoy wrote in, David always takes internet BDC training to the next level. Thanks again for a great webinar. You rocked it. And Thank with you, Rick. That, with that, I think I'm going to finally let you go. I mean, that was a tremendous, tremendous amount of information, great insights, and I, I, I knew, I knew you were going to put people on their toes on this one. David Kane, 
Thank you again for rocking another Dealer On webinar. Couldn't thank you more. Thank you, Eliana. You have a great day, and thanks everyone for joining. Thank you so much. Of course, phenomenal presentation by David Kane. Don't worry, David, you can shut off your webcam now. We love you. Um, obviously, we're way past the top of the hour. We went through all the questions, but if you have any more questions for David, please don't hesitate to contact him directly. He's one of the nicest, most awesomest guys in the automotive, uh, automotive industry. You can reach him at david at kaneautomotive.com. also want to let you know a copy of this webinar recording it's going to be emailed to you later today for your reference. Please feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Today's webinar is also going to be posted online within 24 hours. All you have to do is go to dealeron.com slash webinars, and there you can view our upcoming webinar schedule or access any of our past webinars. Also, at the conclusion of this webinar, you're going to receive a short survey. Fill it out. We want to know what you thought about David Kane's presentation today. We're always looking for great feedback, but... We are also going to reward you for your input. We're going to randomly select a couple of people from all those completed surveys to also win some Google Prizes. Please get involved with that. And yes, invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next webinar. David, where are you? <laughs> there you go. There you go. There you okay. go. And, and we... you got to keep me engaged, Juliana. <laughs> It's okay. Now, now that you got to this slide, you can have your mental margarita, my friend. You have definitely, definitely earned it. But um, Jason Rice is going to be here. He's the owner of Lot Pop. He's going to be talking about five processes to improve gross and volume for your used car operation. Who couldn't use that information? That's right. Used car managers are tasked with a tricky balancing act to move more metal off the lot without sacrificing gross and profit. However, those same used car managers are asked to continually improve even though there are some dealership processes that are simply not in the used car manager's control. How can you manage something you can't control? Well, would you like to know how to sell more used cars with higher gross and profit? Of course you would. In this eye-opening one-hour webinar, Jason Rice is going to teach you the five controllable key processes that are essential for every used car manager to get inventory turning and get both gross and profit. Attendees will leave this webinar with the easy five easy to implement processes that a used car manager has the most control over that will make the biggest difference in their used car operation positively affecting your dealership's bottom line with fewer missed opportunities for profit improvement. Attendees will also learn why some of the most commonly believed major factors like having the right cars is not on his most controllable process list. What? That's right, you heard me. If you want to learn five processes to learn I'm sorry, to improve gross and volume for your used car operation, then this is a must-see presentation. So don't miss it. Don't forget, DealerOn's weekly webinars are held Thursdays, 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, 9 a.m. Pacific. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding these webinars and our topics, hey, contact me directly. My name is Eliana Raggio. I love to hear from you. Track me down online, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, all the automotive social networks, including KaneAutomotive.com, or email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. Thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today, and I hope to see you all on another webinar in DealerOn's continuing education series. Take care.